The second part then that Herrick takes up is what does rhetoric do in the world? What is its role in, in human life, in society? So it has these characteristics, but what does it do? And there's six key functions, six things that it does in the world. First, rhetoric tests ideas. These can seem very abstract at first, um, but this is a very important point because this is how we come to understand new things. Reasoned deliberation, otherwise known as rhetoric, allows differing ideas to be weighed and considered on their own merits. I think this, you think that, and it's through rhetorical discourse that both sides can be weighed. Okay, and it tests, tests those ideas because ultimately, one set of ideas will prevail. A decision will be made on the basis of the better idea. Okay, the better point. This is where audiences come in again as so important. They're crucial. If discourse doesn't have an audience, it's not rhetorical. And one of the things that audiences do, they help the rhetor, the writer, the speaker, create the text because they are guessing, they're making informed assumptions about the, uh, what the audience wants, what they like, what they will consider to be logical. But audiences also check the quality of a rhetor's ideas. And rhetors then modify their ideas, their positions, based on what an audience will accept as true or plausible or fair. So rhetoric has this really crucial function. This is very clear in our political life, especially now as we are revving up for the 2012 campaigns, for the presidential campaign. We see candidates testing ideas all the time. They make a speech at a little machine shop on the other side of Detroit, and they test an idea, like, will people go for paying for birth control in all of their health plans? And they put it out there, and then people go, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, this is a huge problem. No, 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 we're not going to do this. So there's all these ways that ideas get put out in front of particular audiences, and based on that reaction, those ideas are tested as tenable, as possible, as legitimate, as problematic, um, whatever it is. So audiences are really um, crucial. And the other thing is that rhetoric is basically, when it boils down to it, an alternative to fighting, to physical fighting or war. Rhetoric is a peaceful way to work out differences. When you can't figure out a peaceful way through language, through writing, through symbolic action, marching, protesting, whatever it is, if the difference is that big, you're going to fight. Just like you're going to fight with your friend, fight with your you know, spouse, fight with your brother. Rhetoric has broken down. You have gotten to the point where your only option is to argue, is to fight about it, and maybe come to blows. So rhetoric is a way, is a very peaceful, relatively peaceful way to work out differences. And as we talked about before, differences is sort of the fundamental basis for all of this. It's all of the differences between us individually and within our groups. The second thing that rhetoric does in the world is it assists advocacy. It helps us advocate for things that we like, things that we want, things that we care about. Rhetoric is how we advocate for what we deem to be important. There are what we might call structured forms, institutionalized forms of advocacy. This is the world of law, legal proceedings, courtrooms. You have to follow certain protocols. You can't just go in there and say what you want. You have to use a particular language. It has to follow a particular structure but you are ultimately advocating within the legal system for one side or the other. Um, politics is another highly structured form of advocacy. There are ways that we elect our public officials. 
There are ways that they represent our views in different forums. There are particular ways that laws and policies get um, advocated for and passed. You could think of religion as a kind of structured advocacy. It's an institution that advocates for a set of ethics and for a set of beliefs um, that has a lot of structure around it. People follow rules and ideas in, in very clear ways. Education can also be thought of as a kind of structured advocacy for certain ideas. And then we engage in everyday advocacy all the time. There's just kind of run-of-the-mill ongoing advocacy where we're trying to get others to agree with us. To, and that could be a big idea, an important idea, or it can be something really small. Okay, so we advocate and use rhetoric to assist that advocacy probably innumerable times a day. Third, rhetoric distributes power. And this is really important. And this is another reason why, one, the Blue Gold Seminar is structured around rhetoric. Because rhetoric distributes power. And it's also really important to study because studying rhetoric helps you, un helps you see and understand how power is distributed in and among people, in and among cultures and groups of people. So how does this work? There's personal power. If you are a good, effective rhetor, if you can understand what your audience wants, if you can create identification and align your motives with theirs, if you can do all of those things that um, that's, are the hallmarks of effective rhetoric, you have personal power. People will generally then do what you want them to do. Rhetoric gives us personal power. It also, and this can be sort of an unethical, problematic side of rhetoric, um, it also provides a very powerful form of psychological power. When we talk about the way that we know certain things, that we've come to believe certain things, institutions and individuals have used rhetoric to persuade you of things. Everything that you believe, everything that you know, everything that you value has been told to you, advocated upon you in some psychological way. Now that's not bad, but we do know that in the history of the world, human beings have been persuaded to believe very horrible things, very untrue things, very illogical things, right? And so people like Hitler exacted a lot of psychological power over a lot of people. And that was also then augmented with military power and economic power, but it was a very powerful um, form of controlling people. But it's also a way that, um, that we believe very positive things too. And of course, it's related to political power. So those are the three forms of power that are related to rhetoric, personal, psychological, and political. We ha you have to have a lot of rhetorical skills to get along in the political world especially in America, especially in the West. We saw the triumph of Barack Obama in part because of his oratory. When we talk about the way in which rhetoric distributes power, really important questions come up. And again, this is why it's important to know about and why it's useful to study. Not everyone gets the floor. So we have to ask, who gets to speak? In what situation, who gets to speak? Who's heard? Who is valued enough? Who has enough credibility, perhaps enough situated ethos to be heard, to be believed? Whose ideas are valued? Some people are like, ah, that's just a bunch of crap. You're crazy. And then other people are like, oh my gosh, that's the most amazing thing I've heard. Okay, rhetoric helps us understand how we make those decisions. What topics are permissible? There are topics that we can't talk about. 
Now, there are certainly sort of cultural taboos, right? You can't talk about X or you can't talk about Y. But there are also, and there are social rhetorical situations in which it's not appropriate to talk about X. So say, for example, in a work situation, it's not appropriate to talk about personal life. Okay, so what, but also in culture, part of the problem of minority groups is that the topics that they want to talk about aren't even sort of valued as topics. They're not even sort of permissible to even begin to talk about. So it, it has a huge impact on how change can happen and how minority groups can get their ideas heard. Um, topics also and, and language, this idea of being permissible, of being valued, has a lot to do with Kairos. We talked about Kairos a lot in the past couple of weeks, but Kairos sets a time, a good time for something to be said. And Kairos changes over time so that there are good times, good possible times to talk about things, and then other times where it can't be talked about. Um, things like racism and race, you know, you can talk about it in some ways at some times with some people in certain situations. And then what language is permissible? So there's all kinds of explicit and unspoken rules or expectations about what kind of language can and cannot be used in a particular situation. And all of that relates to how rhetoric and rhetorical discourse distributes power across people within a um, group or society. The fourth um, thing that rhetoric does in the world is that it discovers facts. Okay, this might seem abstract, but we can think about the fact that we need evidence to support our, to support our ideas. Whatever ideas those might be, we typically are called to act to marshal some kind of evidence that we're right, that our hunch is accurate or on the right track, that our ideas are worth thinking about. We need some evidence. Looking for evidence, we can also understand that process as research, but looking for that evidence brings new facts to light. In going out and trying to find evidence for a big point or a small point, new facts are brought to light. So it's in the process of research, in the process of exploration, in the process of discovery that new things are found out. Okay, so rhetoric discovers ideas, discovers those facts. Sometimes as evidence, we offer new ways to understand facts. Sometimes we offer as evidence for our point new connections among facts. So you're not just discovering a new thing, like there are 100 other um, Pluto-like planets also in our solar system that we didn't know before. You don't just discover new things. But a lot of what we do is we discover new relationships among things that we already know. We understand those things that we know in new ways. And in doing those things, new arguments can be made. New knowledge can be made. People will believe new things. The opposition of ideas, okay, that very opposition, I, I want A, you want B, I think X, you think Y, that very process of op opposition makes us refine and revise our own ideas. It makes us refine our understanding of them. Fifth, rhetoric shapes knowledge. Rhetoric shapes knowledge. Not some knowledge, all knowledge. Rhetoric is epistemic. Herrick talks about how rhetoric is epistemic and what he means by that, it's knowledge building knowledge making, knowledge creating. Okay, how does this work? How do we know what we know? How do we agree on what's right or wrong? 
How do we come to value one kind of knowledge over another? Why, in some cases, is personal experience more valuable than hard data? Why, in other situations, is hard numbers and facts more important than the experience of millions of people? So kinds of knowledge are valued in different ways. Once an idea has been thoroughly tested by a community, so again, rhetoric is testing ideas. It's putting it out there over and over again. The rhetors are modifying the ideas to see what people will accept as true, as right, as just. And that process goes on and on and on over time. And once it's been tested, thoroughly kind of gone through that process, it becomes part of what we know, what we accept as knowledge. So what we talked about this at the beginning of the year about academic discourse. What we know as facts and knowledge is simply that which has gone through a long, long, long process of being tested and reaffirmed or tested and revised by rhetors and audiences over time. It's not like there are just facts sitting out in the world for people to discover. They have to put those ideas, even if it's about like rocks, they still have to put those ideas out there to people to say, I don't know, I don't think it's that kind of rock. I disagree with you. It looks more like this other kind. Or here's how old I think it is. OK, six, rhetoric builds community. So this is its last important function in the world. Rhetoric builds community. Um, <clears throat> it keeps us connected. Again, we talked about fundamental differences between us as, as individuals, between us as, as groups. Rhetoric builds community. Rhetoric is about identification, about what we have in common. Where can we build bridges? What do we share? Where do we overlap? Okay. So it's about how groups define themselves in relation to others. And how they do it happens through rhetoric. It's about common cause. Rhetoric helps us understand what we have in a sort of common cause with people. So not just what do we sort of physically have in common, but what motives, what desires, what purposes, what um, aspirations do we share in common. Rhetoric is really important in building and maintaining community across time. So how do we think that we are connected to people long gone? Rhetoric maintains those connections. It's through rhetorical discourse that we continue to see ourselves in the history of our people or a people or an event. So there are huge historical time gaps between groups of people, but some people say, we've been here the whole time. We are the same. Rhetoric in the way that it builds the community is what allows us to say we are the same as X people from 400 years ago or maybe even longer ago. And it also helps us maintain and build communities across geographical distances. So think about, say, like the Jewish community. The Jewish community is widely spread all across the entire world. It's rhetoric that holds them together. And we can call it traditions, history, texts. That's rhetoric that holds them together. So think about any group of people, Hmong people, that are scattered all over in a sort of a diaspora across the world. It is language. It is the way that we build knowledge in that community, the way that we test ideas in that community that holds that community together and makes some people Hmong and others not. Okay, It's not just about, we're not talking about physical, ethnic, racial differences. We're talking about communities. And in this way, we can talk about discourse communities, that a lot of what communities have in common is language. So not just language like English or Hmong or Thai, 
but ways of talking. So you exist within many discourse communities in your life. Your family is its own discourse community. You have your own ways of talking about things, your own terms, your own slang, your own references that people, your friends come over and they're like, what did your dad mean by that? And you, okay, so, and this happens with your friends. Groups of friends create a discourse community. Inside jokes, references, ways to talk about things. That's rhetoric connecting you to other humans. Uh, discourse communities, um, our class is a discourse community. America is a discourse community. There's all kinds, so it's not just language like, like English and things. It's uh, ways of speaking. So discourse really keeps people together and continues to build those bridges over and over again. So what I want you to do now in our last minutes is jot down one or two questions that you have for me based on what you read and what we talked about today. So take a few minutes, take out a piece of paper and jot down some <clears throat> a question or two that you have from the reading or from what was just presented here.